Welcome to WPC's annual farm hall and our first one held virtually. We have an excellent panel discussion planned featuring Representative Mike Chapman, Representative Joel Kretz, Mr. Dennis Swinger, and Mr. Mark Herkey. Tuning in to help us with discussion topics including agricultural labor, wildfire mitigation, predator management, and the 2021 legislative session. I'd like to take a moment to welcome the elected officials who are tuned in, House Minority Leader, Representative J.T. Wilcox, Representative Joe Schmick, Representative Lou Ann Van Werven, Representative Mary Dye, Representative Vicki Kraft, Representative Tom Dent, Representative Alex Ybarra, Senator Judy Warnick, and Representative Jeannie Mossbrook, excuse me, Gina Mossbrucker. Thank you for being with us today. For those of you who are not familiar with Washington Policy Center's Ag Initiative, my name is Pam Lewison, and I am the researcher tasked with covering agricultural policy issues here in Washington. If you're wondering what makes me qualified to do that, I'm a fourth generation farmer in Eastern Washington, where my husband and I grow forage crops alongside my parents who grow a variety of row crops. I'm also the niece of a cattleman in the Okanagan Highlands and the granddaughter of a fruit tree grower in the Yakima Valley with a master's degree from Texas A&M. The Ag Office at WPC has explored some big topics on my watch, including the kinds of taxes farmers pay and how much they pay, conservatively estimated at $1 billion a year. I've advocated for the continued support of H-2A workers and farm workers in our state. And before the end of 2020, we'll be highlighting the efforts of the farm community to, pers to persevere through COVID re-examining those taxes paid by farmers in more detail and looking at ways to support the mental health of the farm community. Before we get started, there are a couple of housekeeping items to keep in mind. We'll start the panel discussion with a few questions from me and then open the remainder of the time for questions from the audience. If you've got a question you'd like to have asked, please use the question box function that's on the side of your screen or email me directly at plewison at washingtonpolicy.org. Now, a word from Washington Policy Center President Dan Mead-Smith. Thanks, Pam. And it's great to have all of you with us today. Again, um, I'm Dan Mead-Smith. I'm the president of the Washington Policy Center. And we're thrilled to have you at our annual farm hall that we usually hold all over the state and today we're doing one virtual one and uh, it's great that we can reach even more corners of the state by doing it virtual so thanks for tuning in today we have a great group signed up and a great group who's who's joining the call as we speak washington policy center for those of you that are new to our organization and we have a great group of people who are brand new to washington policy center who are registered is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy think tank similar to some of the national groups you may have heard of like the Heritage Foundation or American Enterprise Institute. We produce policy research, analyze legislation that's introduced in Olympia, and offer our policy recommendations on a whole variety of issues. We have seven research centers or research focus areas like uh, agriculture, as Pam mentioned. We work on small business issues, transportation, budget tax, environmental issues, uh, healthcare, education are some of the research centers we have at Washington Policy Center. So we cover all the key areas that impact your life, no matter where you live in Washington State and what's happening also during the legislative session uh, in Olympia each year. We propose our own policy ideas. We analyze bills as introduced in Olympia. We analyze ballot measures that you'll be voting on in, in November and we um, produce information so you can make informed decisions and convey that information to your policymakers. We have offices all over the state, um, Seattle, Olympia, Tri-Cities, and Spokane, and we have board members and staff members all across Washington State, including several in Eastern Washington. We produce policy papers. We're in the media on a regular basis. We get our work out through writing op-eds, on radio programs, on TV, and uh, numerous of our, of our policy ideas have been passed into law either by voters or signed into law by the governor over the years. And we also stop what we think is 
bad public policy that would have a negative impact on Washington's families and Washington's businesses. We'd love for you to join with us. If you're not already a member of Washington Policy Center, you can join as little as $50 to become a member. We also have other levels um, where you can have different benefits of being part of the organization, which include receiving our weekly policy updates that will give you a quick overview of what's happening in Washington public policy every Friday, a subscription to our quarterly magazine viewpoint, um, receiving our mailings via email or regular mail so you can receive our publications and invited to numerous events like this one and our in-person events when we're allowed to do those again. And again, you can join as a member of Washington Policy Center by going to washingtonpolicy.org. There's a donate and join button on there where you can join and learn more about our organization. You can also email us at wpc at washingtonpolicy.org wpc at washingtonpolicy.org and we'd love to have you as a member and be part of our effort to um, improve people's lives through free market solutions rather than more government control um, that we're seeing um, you know throughout the year in olympia we offer free market solutions on a variety of policy areas including ag and again being a member of washington policy center would be a great way to stay up to date on pam's great work on the ag issues that impact you and your business and your family. And we hope that you join with us. Thanks again for joining today. We appreciate everyone's attendance and interest in this issue and your support of our ag initiative, which is our most recent one that we started a few years ago. It's been a great success and we owe that to all of our supporters around the state that have helped support our work and our um, impact we're having on ag and farming policy. All right, I'll turn it back to you, Pam. Thank you, Dan. So as we get this panel started, I'd like to introduce my panelists. We'll start with Representative Joel Kretz. He comes to us from the seventh legislative district all the way up in Wakanda. He's the deputy leader for the House Republican Caucus. He sits on the rules and rural, rural development, agriculture and natural resources committees in the house. Next, we have Dennis Swinger Jr. He is a Lind area farmer, the first vice chair of the Ag Forestry Leadership Program Board of Directors, and involved in several other community organizations as well. Also joining us is Mark Herkey. He's the Yak a Yakima area farmer, president of the Yakima County Farm Bureau, and also a volunteer with several other community organizations. And finally, we have Representative Mike Chapman from the 24th Legislative District, all the way over in Port Angeles. He's the vice chair of the labor and of the labor and workplace standards committee and sits on the rural development agriculture and natural resources transportation finance and rural rules committee committees in the house uh, is everyone with us i think we're just just about there getting representative chapman on on the line so while we're waiting for him, uh, I'm gonna start with, uh, I told the panel that we'd start with some easy questions, uh, but I don't know if there are any easy questions in uh, in this, this ag world that we live in today. So I'll do my best to keep them uh, somewhat easy. Um, so I'm gonna start with you, Representative Kretz, um, because we just, we just had the smoke finish clearing from the wildfires and there's been reports of some big wildfires down in Colorado and other places. So um, from your perspective as both a legislator and a rancher in an area where you could see the fires from, uh, from your place, what do we need to do um, to, to try to address those fires as a state? And, and how, how do you think we can, um, best mitigate them uh, without falling back on on the ag standard of uh, log it graze it or watch it burn wow you took words right out of my mouth um <laughs> i guess you know we've we've worked uh especially starting you know 2014 2015 after we had the huge fires um those two years we burned half a million acres just in okanagan county so there's not a whole lot more we can see about fires uh, in this part of the country. Um, but my focus is, is um, 
more prevention. You know, I, I think we've made some improvements in the firefighting. We've got a long ways to go, but I've seen some positive developments. We've got, uh, uh, I think, improvements in pre-positioning. Um, we've got uh, more resources out on the ground. I think we're doing a little bit better job than we were with uh, the local districts, uh, local contractors, local resources, which I think is absolutely critical to be at all successful in the firefighting. Um, but my focus is is more on a preventative end, and I don't think that we can uh, expect to have any success without dealing with uh, you know the overcrowded conditions in our forests. Um, there's a lot of ways to remove, remove fuels. Uh, I, I always urge people to go out to the Sinlahican Wildlife Refuge uh, in Okanagan County, where they started a thinning and prescribed burn program about 20 years ago. Um, during the 2015 fires, I was out there. Uh, it was black for miles, not a blade of grass. And that fire came in there, dropped to the ground, uh, moved along the ground, no crowning out. Uh, it was amazingly successful, and it was a, the most graphic model I've ever seen. It It even uh, convinced Hans Dunshee, of all people, that maybe we should start doing something in the forest. Uh, and I think we've made some progress, but we've got millions of acres to treat. Um, you know, a lot of what we've seen this year has been rangeland fires. Um, I guess the governor said that, that we probably can't go out and mow all that, but uh, for thousands of years we have been grazing it. And uh, I think we should be looking at uh, similar ideas of, of reducing fuel. And I think uh, uh, more of an intensive managed grazing program would go a long ways on the range lands. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to sort of switch topics somewhat abruptly. Um, this is for Mark and Dennis. Um, ag labor has been a hot topic this summer, and um, for a lot of reasons, both COVID and otherwise, I think. Um, I And I'd like, um, either one of you can jump in how you like, but I'd like you all to just talk a little bit about what your experiences have been this summer. Have, have you seen a a shift in hiring practices um, or have you changed your hiring practices uh, in light of the current um, the current PPE and other regulations we're seeing um, and just any other general thoughts you have about it? You want to go first, Dennis? <laughs> I guess I'll go ahead. I don't know. Our hiring practices are a little bit unusual. Uh, we have relied on either young young family members or young members of the community nearby. Uh, we don't have such a transient labor force uh, similar to what you would have in the basin. We're on kind of on the edge of that. Um, being fortunate enough to have family members, your PPE, I mean, we took it seriously. We had masks and we had hand sanitizers and we did the best we could. We talked about it quite often and really kept everybody in the loop. And that's the biggest thing we did was, was try to keep everyone in the loop and talk about, okay, do you feel comfortable? And that I think is what it it was always on everybody's mind that this is what's happening and from a management standpoint every time you turned around there was some new edict that was just ridiculous from the governor's office and I say that kindly um, some of the things that were happening very early on are just unmanageable or unreasonable to try to accomplish in a large-scale agricultural setting and we did the best we could. We get down to having separate cabs or everybody having a separate vehicle and, and just we did the best we could. So much of that is un, unworkable, but as far as a, a standard labor, it's tough to get people, period. I mean, we are, we're half an hour out of Moses Lake and to get people to come out here for a job, period, is tough. How about for you, Mark? Well, I was kind of lucky. We've got one employee this summer. We were a little bit shorter handed kind of on purpose of other reasons, but also COVID. Uh, but a lot of the farmers on my Farm Bureau board, uh, it was pure hell. 
uh, with the governor shift the shifting sands with the governor's office. And when he dumped that deal about having to have uh, heated water, warm water, tepid water, and the washing stations no more than 110 yards apart, that was just that was beyond the pale. Uh, they backed off on the water temperature, and then they said, "Well, finally, a, a five-gallon bucket and something else was going to work." And yada yada and it was it was amazing because the health the state health department was leaning on health hand sanitizer and the governor was insisting on hand washing stations which quite frankly violates food safety standards you know they're not supposed to be those hand washing stations are not supposed to be out in the harvestable crops but uh and the other problem that my farmers on our board told me about was uh they were having problems keeping the workers in line and following the rules and to the extent where some of these workers were trying to sneak in ahead of ahead of the supervisors and get out in the field and work and and duck and hide and it's just it was a nightmare for quite a while i think it gradually smoothed out as people got figured out that they, the workers figured out they couldn't get around the rules and uh, some of them were leaving the warehouses quitting jobs at warehouses and going out in the fields thinking that they wouldn't get tested or get their temperature taken or answer questions like having a um, having a member in there or they have I think one instance there were like 13 or 14 people in the house that tested positive and one was still working that didn't test positive and he was sneaking out and working <laughs> like nightmare nightmare so um, our, we've got an audience question that I'm going to go ahead and insert um, so I wrote a study uh, at the beginning of the year talking about um, farmers paying taxes. And at the tail end of the last session, um, there was a there was some testimony about how farmers don't pay taxes. And I wrote the study in response to that. Uh, and I will I'll I'll sort of target this to to um, to Dennis and Mark in particular. Um, can you just outline, I guess, for some of our audience members that are maybe not um, farm affiliated, just a, a really quick overview, what sort of taxes are you paying? Um, you know, we don't need numbers, just to maybe roll them out, what those he headings for taxes are um, to give non-farm folks a rough idea of what, what, you, uh, what you roll through each day or each quarter, as the case may be. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, one of the top of the list is property taxes. You know, like my father always said, you know, if you're farming, you're usually land poor. And uh, the way the property taxes have gone lately with this thing with the school equation and everything, it's just, it's nuts. You know, and we're in open space and it's nuts, even in open space. Uh, uh, you know, there's sales taxes on on lots of the things that we buy. Most of the things are still sales tax. Uh, you know, certainly income tax. You mentioned quarterlies that pops into my head, the payroll taxes and and L and I and unemployment tax and and a little bit for family leave and it, it just you know it if if we don't pay taxes, then I guess we're in the wrong category. We need to find out where that exemption is because we haven't found it. Fair enough. Yeah. Representative Chapman, welcome. When you... Thank you. Sorry, Dennis, go ahead. Oh, no worries. It just, it seems like every time you turn around, you've got your regular headings, but then all of a sudden um, you, discover you you forget one you know so oh okay well, i forgot we've got to do separate our uh our fuel tax on our road diesel or just every time you turn around there's like oh i forgot this one and hey, hey did you take care of that it's like oh, it's on the it's on my tickler and i yeah it, it just there's every time you turn around there's just some little one but those big ones of land and the personal property and uh, you know it, it about the time you really try to to get something new and and make an improvement here comes the assessor and then all of a sudden you get to pay a little bit more there 
or you start growing some more crops. Uh, when we started irrigating, the, the assessors came through and all of a sudden, even our, our dry land acres, they wanted to assess those as irrigated because we had water rights on them. And the next thing you know, it's like, man, I, you're wanting more than that dry land ground is worth. Good point. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna switch gears a little bit again. Um, we at the beginning of this we sort of build one of the questions um, to be about also um, predator management. And since we have both of our legislators present, uh, I'm gonna ask them both to field this question. Uh, they both sit on on the ag committee in the in the house and so i'm sure they've had some lively discussion about this um particularly with the news of the gentleman who had to save his own life uh outside of colville in the last week or so i would like to know um what you all think the next steps should be for the state in terms of how we go about dealing with apex predators uh, and particularly what we need to do um, to best address that we have sort of a, two different regions pushing for two different ideas. Don't anybody go ahead, jump. Go ahead, Joel. <laughs> Um, I'm not really optimistic right now. Um, you know, it's a really contentious issue, and you mentioned that, um, you know, there's really two worlds in the state of Washington, those of us who live with wolves uh, and those who don't, uh, and the views in those two areas are really different. Um, you know, I, I felt like we'd made progress in northeast Washington where we've got like 90% of the wolves up here. Um, it's been difficult on everybody. Um, but I've seen some progress over the years. We've had several in-state environmental groups that have actually uh, tried to come up with solutions, I feel like, and, and do they come my way far enough? No, but uh, they're not sitting back uh, in an intractable position. And I think we've made uh, some progress um, moving forward. We've got a better non-lethal program. Um, I think there's been a lot more acceptance up here of uh, we've got wolves, uh, they're not going anywhere. Uh, we need to learn how to live with them. But the missing component so far has been in uh, what happens when all those things don't work. And, uh, you know, that's where it gets really contentious. Some people uh, who live in, I don't know, Seattle, New York City, uh, Fairyland, whatever, uh, they, don't, they, they don't think there's ever any reason to ever kill a wolf. And we are uh, absolutely loaded with them here. I think the official numbers are around 130 of them just in this area. Uh, I would say the numbers are double or triple uh, because they're not out looking all that hard for them. Um, but we have been working through the process. There's a wolf advisory group that has made some progress. Um, we've, we've made a little progress in the legislature. Um, but I think we took a real setback here this summer with the governor weighing in once again in all his wisdom um decided to get into the wolf thing and uh uh directed the department of fish and wildlife to go through another rule making process um but the disappointing part of that was that we've got all these people that have put in tremendous amount of time blood sweat and tears working on a program um i don't think anybody wanted to go the direction he's going and he decided to listen to an out-of-state group um that, that has never sat in on any of the programs. They've never offered any suggestions. They've never tried to come up with solutions, but they filed lots of lawsuits. And uh, when one of them buttonholes him at a fundraiser and tells him what he needs to do, that's what he does. Uh, I don't think that has anything to do with being a public servant. Um, he does things like that without talking to people like me that actually live with them. Uh, and I think those concerns gotta be weighed. I think you've gotta look at the people that are living with them right now. Uh, I'm concerned we're going into a new phase and it's going to be what you call the dark phase where nobody says nothing we'll see what happens representative chapman how about you well 
just real quick, I mean, I'd like to follow up on what Joel said. I, I think a lot of us who represent areas outside of the I-5 corridor are frustrated through a lot of things this year where the governor's made decisions for our districts without talking to those people who represent those districts. And that's one of the areas of commonality. Uh, Representative Kretz and I worked on bipartisan uh, legislation and people asked me, well, well you know, I, I represent the coast. Why do you care? And I'm like, I care because it's important to a fellow representative in their district and nobody knows their district better than Representative Kretz, Representative Maycumber and Representative Short. So it's, I would never presume to say, hey, this is my words of wisdom for your district, nor would I expect that Representative Kretz would, you know, talk to me about my district. So. I think this was a year where uh, lots of bipartisan uh, solutions sat on the table through the inability to reach out to the legislature. Um, so I think there's frustration and a lot of issues, not just on wolves, but my position has always been Representative Kretz represents a big part of the state and I respect, and I've been to his district. I've spent time with him in his district. We spent time in his office talking about these issues. So it's not like, I, and I respect his viewpoint I think there are a lot of issues for my district specific. He respects my viewpoint. I think that's what we need more of. And a governor should be pulling. It, it was when I heard the same thing, I was like, wait a second. Representative Kretz and I had bipartisan legislation. He didn't even call. I mean, I assumed he called you, Joel, but I guess he didn't. I would, you know, but I would have thought that he would have called those of us who were working on it. And, and that's frustrating. That's just part of, but that has happened this whole summer. So we are, you know, it is what it is. And, uh, but don't ever discount, we may be from different political parties, but you can't discount the men and women who represent their districts. There's nobody more of an expert on what's going on in their district than a, than a, than a representative or a county commissioner, which I was for a lot of years. So, I mean, nobody from Olympia or Seattle know, or outside the state knows what's, knows our districts like we do. And, and that's kind of, so. Um, so, uh, on a similar note, uh, Dennis and Mark, how, if you, you have sort of a captive audience here for a moment. So if you could each tell your um, sort of your legislators or the legislators who've tuned in one thing um, about why what you do is important, what would you tell them? Well, I guess from my perspective, it's like the saying goes, everybody doesn't need to be a farmer, but everybody needs one three times a day. I mean, it's just that basic. And uh, I guess I'd like to reflect just a little bit on uh, my appreciation, our Farm Bureau's appreciation for what our legislators do on behalf of us under such honestly adverse conditions. I mean, outnumbered outnumbered doesn't even cover it and a lot of people don't realize that and they probably think oh well they should fix this in olympia and fix that and they don't realize what what people that are sticking up for us on a daily basis are up against but having been in the farm bureau on a board for 10 years 11 years now uh it's been a real eye opener uh what this and of course the struggle is getting worse every year and i i shudder to think what this next general session is going to be it's just like i mean it's Time for hair on fire, I'm afraid. That's my perspective. Well, to uh, to expand on that, you're you're touching on to my ag forestry roots there to tell our story. And to tell my story, what do I do other than combating the forces of disease, famine, and pestilence on a daily basis? I'm a sixth generation Washington farmer. I'm fourth generation on our land. I'm grooming the fifth generation. And that doesn't happen on accident. That That's a commitment to, to being a trustworthy caretaker of the, of the land and the, and the environment. Um, if I could get that across to any legislator, I'm not just out here raping and pillaging and burning and slashing. We are, I'm, I'm treading in my great grandfather's footsteps because he did that. And I'm trying to set up my children, my two boys. I'm, my, my eyes are always ahead of how am I going to set them up for success? 
by the things that I'm doing. I, we signed contracts. I'm 55 years old and I signed a 30 year contract to take bureau water. I didn't sign that for me. I signed that for my kids. So as we look ahead, speaking of the future, um, we we're getting into looking ahead toward the legislative session at least for those of us who are uh policy people like myself and uh, like our representatives here so uh, representative chapman and representative kretz um i'm going to ask you to kind of take out the your crystal ball a little bit just a little and um tell us what you sort of anticipate for the coming legislative session before we um, get into some of these uh, comments and questions that we have rolling in from the audience about what you anticipate um, this coming long session to be like um, over in Olympia. Uh, I'll take a crack at it. First, uh, would appear that it's gonna be a virtual session and we ran through a mock virtual session the other day it didn't go real smooth it went about as well the last words of the speaker was well this you know hope you all realize this may not be the year to introduce a lot of legislation so for those who are afraid of what olympia might do you might actually be glad we won't be potentially in session in person because it's going to really be limited what we can actually accomplish what legislation i think it's going to be damn near impossible to pass major pieces of legislation i think we might take months to even do a budget virtual so i think it's going to be a challenge but i i don't i actually think it's i think we could wake up and be midway through march and not a whole lot has been accomplished um so for those that are don't want the legislature but we have to pass a budget we have to balance a budget we're gonna to have to set a two-year spending plan um and i i you know i you know it, look in a week and a half the legislature could be vastly different so we don't even know what the makeup's going to be. So I think that's I think that's going to be part of what happens too. But I think just the virtual session is going to be really limited in what we can do. It's going to make it even harder to do bipartisan work for those of us who try to work on bipartisan pieces of legislation, just because partially you just do that by walking over to somebody's office and it's just virtually it's going to be more difficult. But um, I don't expect actually I expect it to be kind of budget related. Uh, there'll be those who want some new revenue. I think that'll be difficult, but if and not a lot of policy. That's just my base based on just the fact that it's virtual. It looks like. All right. How about you, Representative Kratz? Well, assuming that I win, um, I've got the same concerns Mike's got. Um, I don't see how virtual works um, for people in the rural parts of the state, like me, like my seatmates, Mike. Um, we don't have uh, cable to our house. Um, you know, I've been on a million conference calls, Zoom calls. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. So how does that work if we're on the floor and there's a bill going and people are giving speeches? And maybe I can follow along on that. Maybe I could even give a speech. But what happens when I start trying to download the 50 amendments on the bill or, or some kind of data on it? Um, these systems out here in the rural parts of the state are not going to handle that, period. Uh, so unless they're planning on rolling some cable out here to the different parts of the state, uh, I don't see how I can possibly even function uh, in a in a have any impact whatsoever. Uh, so I'm planning to go to Olympia, and uh, I'm going to sit in my office and I'm going to meet with as many people as I can, and I'm going to try and do it smart and safe and respectfully. But I don't believe I can participate from Bodie Mountain where I'm sitting right now. So. Uh, I'm going. I think uh, my seatmate Jacqueline May Cumber is have, has the same plans. Uh, I don't see how we would have any any impact from here. And and I also worry about um, the legislature being that insulated. Um, you know, if you think about a virtual session where uh, we don't get input from other people, you know, the big part of the the results and and the the movement in the legislature is being able to to grab somebody and say hey what do you think about this you know and, and mike and i talk a lot during session um 
we've I think done some really good things because we understood each other and we understood each other's district's needs. And trying to play that um, on Zoom from here doesn't work. So I, I'm concerned about that insulation and that it could be an absolute kind of a power play. Um, gosh, half the people couldn't get on the floor virtually. So here we go. Um, it just doesn't seem like what we signed up to do and what uh, what our constituents expect out of us. So uh, that's my plan so far. All right. Good answers from you both. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I, Dennis, I have a, a question for you from the audience, and I'm going to let you field it because you're a panelist and I'm not. Uh, so, give us the the post-it note version of what Bureau Water is. Uh, Bureau Water for us means water from the Columbia Basin Irrigation Project, uh, specifically from the East Low, um, from the canal. That's what okay. Bureau Water means for us. We are we are in the what they call the EL 475 project. We're at the end of that pipeline. They are piping out of the existing canal rather than trying to uh, continue and complete the second half of the irrigation project, the Columbia Basin Irrigation Project. It's part of the Odessa uh, groundwater line? replacement program. Correct. Correct. We are yes, we are in the Odessa sub area, and this is to, to mitigate the, the drawdown. We are currently pumping out of existing uh, deep wells that have been declining um, all along for years. I'll take it. That's pretty good. Uh, so. <laughs> I, to be fair, I, for those of you who are tuning in, I worked for the East Columbia Basin Irrigation District for, uh, I believe, two and a half years, almost three years. Uh, Dennis Swinger and I got to know each other quite well over a counter where I talked to him a lot about uh, getting water from that project. Uh, so this question is for Representative Chapman. Uh, Representative Chapman talked about bipartisan work on rural issues. How can legislators work together and maintain these relationships without face-to-face -face interaction? Well, like Joel said, I, it's, I mean, you can all, you know, we have each other's phone numbers. We can pick up the phone and we, you know, I think there's some of that. I, I think it is going to be, you know, it is difficult. Um, you know, I have to kind of follow the lead of our of our leader, and we're being told we won't be allowed to be in our office because that question has been asked. So I don't know how that's going to work, whether we can be shut out of our office. But I think the minority obviously can do what their leader decides. So I, mean, I don't want to get in a big argument. With, I, I would love to work out of my office, first of all. I mean, so and then that does create the ability to work together. So I think I think you have to make I think there are legislators who make an effort. To work across the aisle and i think there are legislators who don't make that effort they don't really need to um i i come from a district where that's a benefit uh, people want to hear that i work across the aisle and i think joel comes from the same district i was welcomed when i went up to his district i mean i was you know introduced as the liberal from the west coast and that's fine to to the northeast washington i guess i'm i'm a raging liberal but i was welcomed and he'd be welcomed in my district and people would people like to hear that we're working together i've mentioned his name a lot uh, more than probably any legislators during this uh, season of rubber chicken circuit. So he's well known in my district. He's pretty popular out here. So, <laughs> but people like to hear that you're working. They like to hear that a west, northwest, northeast legislator find common areas. And it's not just wolves. We we you know we serve on ag and natural resources together. And, um, I think we find way more commonality in these issues. So it it's an effort though. It's an effort. There's a lot of legislators. They don't have to. They don't have to. And I think we all would know those who don't try. Um, so there, we've got a, a lot of questions rolling in that are all very similar in uh, in their sort of general idea. So I'm going to I'm going to sort of ask it in two different ways. Um, for for Dennis and Mark, you both. Um, sort of are affiliated with organizations that talk a lot about telling farmer stories. So what are your best 
sort of tips for farmers who are trying to engage legislators and are trying to sort of tell ag's story in a meaningful way uh, to to lawmakers well i've been to olympia a couple times i guess i'll and, go uh, one, oh, oh go ahead dennis oh, oh go ahead you, you started go for it okay a uh, couple times uh one in particular where it was kind of a personal fight that we had with the wildlife department uh, over a hydraulics permit that we had and and uh i'll just kind of paraphrase what happened we went over there and we visited with a number of legislators and we found that they were very very well received uh we everywhere we went we found friends and made friends amongst le uh, representatives and senators from around the state uh, the cattlemen's association kind of shepherded the thing at that time and so I guess the, the thing of it is, is, is that people need to pick up and go over there and talk to their, their representative folks over there and let them know, you know, what's going on. And, and that's kind of a key because uh, without communication, you don't, you just don't get anything done. I'll also echo the, the need to go engage a legislator in in olympia is is critical and or engage them in their office it, i've yet to run across a legislator that wouldn't make time for you um I've, i i remember i caught up to representative schmick in the hallway uh between caucusing it was just one of those deals and that was when we were there for the ag forestry legislative seminar i i just to tell all my fellow ag people your legislators aren't these people that are on an ivory tower they, they want to hear from you i've yet to hear have somebody say no man i don't want to i don't want to talk to you i don't want to hear from you but be respectful no matter who you're talking to and dress appropriately don't roll in and in, in cargo shorts and a t-shirt if you show up Show up in, in business dress and be respectful to the office, be respectful to the capital, be respectful to who you're talking to, but tell your story and have that thought out before you show up. If you're going for a particular uh, issue, one piece of paper, large font, three things. Here's what I want to talk about. Here are the bullet points because one thing that just blew me away <laughs> on a state and a national level is the pure amount of data it's like drinking from a fire hose i really I, I can't take my hat off enough to you folks that are there the sheer amount of data that you deal with incoming on a daily basis is phenomenal the fact that you're able to sort through that so my key things to to somebody that's going go over there engage somebody if you can't get to olympia find your representatives and your senators when they're in their office hours in the district and they'll, i'm like guarantee you they'll make time for you and be articulate when you show up don't be afraid of them they are i have like i said i've yet to find somebody that did not want to hear from you okay uh and so i'll ask a sort of the sort of the same question or a similar version of that question um, to both of our representatives. Um, what What's the one um, thing that's most meaningful to the both of you um, when a when a constituent shows up? What's the most impactful thing for 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 you? Um, you know, is it a is it a genuine conversation in your office? Is it a you know is it a letter? What's what makes the most meaningful impression in those busy times during the session? Uh, well, I, th I think probably it's it's somebody that really cares about something, um, that they're there to deal with something that, that's on their heart that is huge in their world. And, and when you see that earnestness come through, um, it makes everybody sit down and shut up and listen. And uh, I think it makes a heck of an impression. But I, I, the one point I would like to throw out 
is, you know, when folks are coming to Olympia talking to legislators, um, you've got to understand that they're from all walks of life, all kinds of backgrounds, and you can't be so technical that they don't understand. I've watched, you know, especially on the wolf issue, for example, uh, the cattlemen always figure, well, by God, I just need to go over there and tell them how it is. And they start talking in terms about waning weights and open cows and heifers and things that 90% uh, of the people in the legislature have never heard and they've lost them in the first 10 seconds because they're speaking a different language. You've got to understand that um, not everybody has lived the same life you have and you've got to be pretty simple a lot of times. Uh, you know, just keep it really basic. Uh, he mentioned earlier, you know, the bullet points is really helpful. A one pager uh, is really nice because um, it's it's a freight train over there and it's, it's going a million miles an hour. There's usually 15 minutes to a meeting. Um, and, and we do that all day long, sometimes 12, 14 hours. So you want to be one of the people that stand out at the end of the day uh, when we are done in the evening and you think back on the things that hit you that day, trying to be one of those people that make an impact. I, I agree with that. I mean, obviously, if you're a constituent from the district, you know, that's meaningful because somebody came to address their representative. But, I, but I'll also say it's pretty meaningful. So because I serve on uh, Ag Committee, you know, I, I have gotten to know the potato growers. They, they come and visit with me and, and uh, the you know the tree the tree fruit growers um, and the cattlemen's association and so I've gotten to know a number a number of them by name so they're not from my district and I probably don't have a lot of members in my district but it's pretty meaningful when they they respect me to take time out of their busy day because they they have their own representatives and there's a lot of representatives that have their interests so I just those are some conversations that I've actually that have been some of the more meaningful. What I do wish is honestly, I wish we'd have more kind of bipartisan meetings with some of those groups. So pull uh, pull me and Joel together, and 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 have you know we did that with the wolf uh, a couple wolf meetings where Joel and I hosted kind of a group of folks. But we probably should think about that uh, down the road when we get back to full operation. But uh, yeah, so. Dennis and Mark, you're welcome to come visit. Anytime you're in Olympia, come by and say hi. Uh, it would be meaningful to me, and I think I'd probably learn from uh, you guys. One other, one other thing, if I might add, don't, if, as a point of advice to my fellow ag people, don't be afraid to give your information to a legislative assistant. The Like, like was mentioned, their days are in 15-minute blocks. And if you can grease the skids ahead of time, call and make an appointment, brief that legislative assistant with what you're going to do, and be prepared. You know, it, if they've got 15 minutes, don't spend 11 and a half of it him and hauling and figure out what you're going to say. And especially on the national scene, man, the 22-year-olds run the hill, and the legislative assistants are key to these people's operations. Yeah. So I've got. And they're got, generally a lot smarter than they are too. Yeah. <laughs> I, so, I'd like to I'd like to throw in just a little bit there, Pam, if I could, please. Sure. Um. And and then okay. Mark, after that, we're going to try and a couple. I want to try and squeeze in a couple more questions before we wrap it up. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to be real short. I really want to thank Joel Kretz on this, and and I really want to thank uh, Representative Chapman for being here and uh, bipartisanship. I remember when we had our fight over in Olympia with wildlife department, we saw Democrats and we saw Republicans and mostly it came down to lines whether they were more rural oriented rather than urban oriented as far as where they were friendly to what, what we were trying to do. Uh, but we didn't see any distinction between Democrat representatives that were rural and Republican. It was all the same and I wish we could get back to where Democrats and Republicans can work on issues instead of just drawing lines on a football field and, and start scrimmaging. So anyway, I'll get out of here. Um, so I want I've got two more questions that I'd really like to get answered. So I'm going to try and move these through somewhat quickly. Um, the first one is uh, a question that I, it's probably pretty specific for our legislators. It says, 
What about the role of public opinion on legislative decisions? If the urban public believes an issue should go a particular way and demonstrates outrage resulting from being misinformed by anti-farming activists, is it possible for a lawmaker to still listen to those farm voices that speak the truth and make the right decision despite public pressure? Farmers are few and urban voters are many. So I'll jump in. Um, what I can tell you is that the people that are trying to attack farming, ranching, um, different natural resource things have absolutely mastered that method. Um, they don't have to be honest. They don't have to be truthful. They have to have effective sounding sound bites. And, and I think I mentioned earlier, um, the governor's succumbing to that. Um, we see it all the time. Uh, there's lots of pressure. They know how to put pressure on urban legislators that don't really have a background. You can't blame them for that. It's not a fault. It's just a reality. They don't have the background. And if they get a bunch of um, really aggressive people lobbying on something, a lot of times they're not going to get the truth. So it's up to all of us uh, in Ag Natural Resources to make sure we're getting there because we're uh, you know, we're the last voice. And, and I, I guess one thing that I've tried to do here is get people to come over and visit, come on over, see the ranch. And, you know, even some of the most strident urban dwellers that think, uh, you know, we're trying to destroy the world, they spend a day or two here and they see it really differently. You know, we've got the uh, Farmer for the Day program, you know, Dave Manroll has done that for years, been really effective. Um, I think getting urban legislators over to see things firsthand and see how we're really living, and the things that, that we're up against, uh, I think even just one at a time, that's uh, the most effective thing we can be doing. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I probably don't have much. I know you have another couple of questions, so I, I, I think Joel said it perfectly. Thank you. First time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my last question, um, Representative Chapman, you referenced that you think the legislative session is going to be largely budgetary. Um, this has been sort of a, a tough year for the ag community um, in a lot of ways. And um, going back to some of our earlier discussion about um, some of the testimony about farmers not paying taxes, um, I, it's sort of a, a double-barreled question. So first, I'd like to know what um, what the the response that um, both Representative Chapman and, and Representative Kretz had to that initial testimony um, about farmers not paying taxes, and also um, whether or not either of you suspect that there may be um, that there may be a, a push to look toward the agricultural community to um, contribute more in taxes uh, in the coming year. Two things that I was having a hard time logging on, speaking of virtual, but so I missed some of the early discussion. Uh, but no, I, actually, I don't think the ag community, ag community is going to be looked to. Uh, I don't think that's going to be an area where folks look for additional revenue. With regards to taxation on uh, urban, uh, you know, farming, all I can say is, so I'm a timber district, and I was able to pass an extension of a preferential tax rate for uh for for timber uh last set not last session but the session before and it would it extended a tax break that would have expired in a couple of years after 2045 so not only will i not be in the legislature i probably won't be on the earth uh, when it expires so that's kind of a generational so that's my philosophy i, I would adamantly i personally would uh, would oppose any new taxation on on the rural on, on the rural farming ag timber and I've actually worked uh, past two bills to extend tax breaks that benefit my district and would work to do the same for the ag community should those need to be looked at so okay representative Kretz your thoughts well I, I agree with Mike I don't think um, agriculture is going to be specifically targeted um, but they're also always kind of low-hanging fruit and, and probably not the 
first thing on urban legislators minds uh, to protect so um, we've always got to be vigilant on that um, I think uh, you know one of the funding issues that, that I'm going to be working on this year is, is how do we put some more funding into forest health so we're not spending 150 million bucks a year on firefighting you know um, I think that's one that you can argue will have benefits down the road uh, you know in budget budget terms but uh, sorry I still got landlines over here um, that's going to be a real dance is how do we fund that how do we fund it equitably um, you know there's to me it's 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 a, a state responsibility I believe that um, well, I think we got kind of a jump start on that with a little smoke in Seattle this year. I think uh, I wouldn't wish smoke on anyone, but if it's going to blow somewhere, I kind of hope it blows to Seattle um, because they're actually recognizing maybe we're having a wildfire problem lately. So uh, that's going to be one of the funding things. It's going to be tough, and, and we're going to be asking for funding from the whole state on that. All right. Well, um, I'm going to wrap it up there so we try to keep it on time and be mindful of of, um, of the contribution that you all have made with your time today. Um, so I, I would, let me uh, pull up my video here so we can, here we are. Um, so first, uh, for the audience that's still with us, as Dan mentioned, please consider joining Washington Policy Center and get on our mailing list for, for the Ag Project and some of our other centers. Uh, as we head into the busy legislative session, uh, it's your best chance to keep up on ag and farming issues and the the best way to stay in tune with what's going on during the legislative session. Um, you can email me at plewison at washingtonpolicy.org or go to washingtonpolicy.org to, to join the Policy Center or to learn more about what it is we do. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone on my panel um, for their time and their contribution today. It's much appreciated uh, and your time is valuable, I know, and uh, without you, uh, this virtual farm hall, um, the first one we've ever had, would not have been the success that it is. So thank you very, very much for your time and for all of your insights on the topics we've discussed today. And uh, thank you all in the audience out there in internet land for joining us as well. And I hope everyone has a great evening.